By July 1969, the battle lines in the ruling Congress party were already drawn. On the one side stood Indira Gandhi, then Prime Minister under siege, now fighting a relentless struggle for political survival. Supporting her were the young Turks and radicals within the party. On the other side stood the old guard, represented in the cabinet by the Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Murarji Desai. Although the battle was ostensibly for the control of the Congress party, both sides took their postures on high moral grounds. Mrs. Gandhi and her supporters continuously reminded the Congress of the party's unfulfilled commitment to socialism. And among the many radical provisions which were promised but which remained unimplemented was the nationalization of banks. Some of us who were in the Congress party, relatively younger people, thought that uh, the resources of the society are there concentrated in banking institutions. It was our firm belief that this resource that is concentrated in the banking institution is the property of the nation, of the, all the people, and the, it should be used for the benefit of all the sections of the society. The July 1969 session of the Congress party held in Bangalore had seen the divide between the two factions in the Congress almost complete. Although the party did ratify the resolution for the nationalization of banks, it was opposed by the finance minister, Murarji Desai. On the 16th of July 1969, Indira Gandhi took away the finance portfolio from Murarji Desai, who promptly resigned from her cabinet. To take full responsibility for the implementation of this program, Srimati Indira Gandhi took over the finance portfolio. Later, a presidential ordinance issued on 19th July nationalized 14 major banks. The step, said the Prime Minister, would quicken the pace of economic development. By November 1969, the Congress party had split. In February 1970, the Supreme Court struck down the nationalization of banks as unconstitutional. But Indira Gandhi renationalized them through another ordinance. The feeling was that under the private ownership and private management, the banks were not doing enough to help agriculture, small industry, retail traders, and other important but hitherto neglected sectors of the economy. That was the dominant motivation behind the idea to nationalize the major banks in the country. But to this day, many economists believe that nationalization of banks could have been avoided. The reason why I feel that bank nationalization not only could, but should have been avoided, uh, was that the, the uh, ownership by government uh, led to an increasing degree of government uh, control uh, and direction, not just to so-called priority sectors, but to sectors and individuals that were preferred uh, by the politicians and subsequently also by some of the bureaucracy. Critics maintain this economic move was propelled by political compulsions of the day and underlined a crucial dogma within which were retained seeds of populism which for the next two decades would shape the nation's economic agenda. When Indira Gandhi asked the president to dissolve the parliament on the 27th of December 1970 and call for fresh elections, she had just abolished privy purses for the former Maharajas. Now the slogan she used to fight her electoral battle was Garibi Hatao remove poverty. In this terse clarion call lay the rationale for what was the principal linchpin of the economic policies of the country. With huge masses living below the poverty line, with basic needs of food, clothing and shelter as their main concern, the political establishment could hardly ignore these issues. It was precisely this concern which the draughtsmen of independent India had in mind when they formulated the first economic policies of the government. Poverty and underdevelopment had both to be tackled on a war footing. The schedule for economic growth was dictated by this sense of urgency. On the domestic front, two centuries of colonial rule had atrophied India's agrarian economy and left it with scarce infrastructure for any meaningful industrialization. For Nehru, investments in heavy industries was critical. 
he looked at rapid industrialization as a solution to many of the pressing problems of an underdeveloped nation.